So uh, Rich uh, talked uh, earlier about uh, remembering that uh, Doug as well, the 25th anniversary of uh, what we're all about here around natural gas vehicles. And so what I uh, want to do this morning is uh, give you a bit of a look into the next uh, 25 years, really the next 25 to 40 years, because uh, that's the time horizon we looked at on this uh, National Petroleum Council uh, study of future transportation fuels. Uh, as Rich said, this thing went on for a couple of years. Uh, I, had, uh, I had just retired from Westport Innovations, frankly, when the, the thing started, uh, uh, semi-retired actually. Uh, I stepped down as president, chief operating officer, and member of the board in January of uh, uh, 2010. And uh, just a couple months later, uh, a call came into Westport, frankly, right out of the blue, uh, from uh, a woman by the name of Linda Capuano, who is uh, vice president of emerging technologies at, at Marathon, Marathon Oil Company. And she had uh, been given the responsibility to organize this effort, which had been commissioned. I'll tell you about uh, the commissioning from Secretary of Energy Stephen Chu. But uh, Linda was forming the, the leadership team, and they'd, they'd been running for three or four months already, so they'd, they'd set up teams for various alt fuels, but it, uh, it kind of occurred to them that they, they didn't really have uh, an ex, ex, you know, much expertise in natural gas vehicles in the, in the oil companies that uh, started the thing and some of the other uh, leadership group. So this call came into Westport, as I say, right out of the blue. She got our phone number from our website. Uh, we're up in Vancouver, Canada, as most of you know. And just asking if she could talk to somebody about this study. And uh, uh, Director of uh, Investor Relations, Darren Seed, uh, passed it over to me because he knew I, I didn't have any responsibilities anymore. You know, I was semi-retired. I was a senior advisor, kind of an ambassador for the company. Figured I was looking for stuff to do. So he said, why don't, why don't you call Linda back, you know? So uh, I, I didn't know Linda, but uh, as soon as she mentioned National Petroleum Council, it, my ears perked up because I, I did have some awareness of the kinds of work uh, they did. It's an organization set up uh, solely for the purpose of advising the Secretary of Energy on issues that he deems important and worthy of significant analysis. So, so my ears perked up, she asked me if I'd uh, participate in the study, I said, sure, you know, can you come to a meeting in two weeks in Houston? Sure. Uh, and uh, before I got to Houston in two weeks, I got a second call from her saying, well, by the way, would you like to be the chairman of this uh, group uh, looking at natural gas? It's like, really? Uh, so I said, I said, sure, that, that sounds fun. But frankly, uh, uh, little did I know how much, uh, how much of an effort this was going to turn out to be. It was, it was billed as, a, I think, a 15-month study at the time. It turned out to, to be about a year longer than that. As Rich said, uh, more than 300 people and organizations involved uh, from all aspects of the American uh, energy industry. Um, and just a tremendous amount of work. So I'll, I'll tell you about the work. I'll tell you about uh, uh, the leadership uh, group and how we structured the study. But most importantly, I'll tell you about the implications, I think, uh, for natural gas and natural gas vehicles and how, how we uh, uh, kind of stood up against uh, not only conventional liquids as a fuel, but the various other transportation alternatives, uh, electric vehicles, biofuels, and hydrogen fuel cell vehicles. Um, so as I mentioned, NPC does its work after getting commissioned from the Secretary of Energy. So in this case, uh, Secretary of Energy Chu laid out a request to do a study of uh, future transportation fuels over the next 40 years, uh, out to the year 2050. And uh, he specifically asked that the study uh, look at uh, the, the role of the increasing supplies of natural gas in the United States, as well as various other alternatives. And he specifically asked that we take a very hard look at uh, greenhouse gas implications of future fuel mixes, in addition to uh, implications for energy security and uh, economic competitiveness and the like. So the. Uh, the group came together. You'll see, you'll see an executive committee at the top. Uh, these are uh, chairmen, CEOs of uh, uh, oil companies and others. Uh, the, the chairman was Clarence Cazalot, the C uh, chief executive of Marathon. Uh, John Watson, the uh, chairman of Chevron, was also in the executive committee. Uh, Deputy Secretary of Energy, uh, John Deutsch, uh, uh, emeritus professor at MIT and others. But the, court, the, the study was actually run by this uh, 
coordinating subcommittee, that, which is the bottom two-thirds of the study. So this was a group of uh, 15 or 20 of us that met uh, at least monthly for, for two years to review all the work that was being done by all the working groups, and I'll, I'll say a, a word more about the working groups in a minute, and to try to make sense of it because, uh, as Rich said, there was just a, an enormous amount of information being generated, uh, very complex questions about uh, how to think about the role of different alternative fuels in future uh, transportation portfolios uh, with all the uncertainties around uh, uh, oil prices and energy prices, uh, costs of uh, new technology, uh, uh, learning curves and deployment uh, possibilities for, for new technologies, et cetera. So this coordinating committee was tasked uh, with trying to uh, create a bit of a consistent framework for reviewing all these different alternatives. Uh, we also structured that group into uh, sub-working groups. So you'll see natural gas kind of in the middle at the top there with myself as the leader of this natural gas working group. But you can see there were working groups for other alt fuels and also various kind of integrating topics like uh, uh, engines and vehicles for light duty, engines and vehicles for heavy duty, et cetera. Uh, this is just kind of a picture of what turned out to be a very complex uh, analytical framework that was developed, uh, developed and used a, a fairly large scale uh, model of the U.S. transportation system and uh, used it to analyze uh, technology across a range of uh, oil prices out for the next 40 years, as well as uh, premises on uh, technology introduction, aggressive, uh, less aggressive. The, uh, the effort uh, that resulted, uh, I'm convinced, is the most comprehensive look at uh, U.S. transportation that's ever been done uh, by the government or anybody else. Uh, particularly as you look at uh, technology and the role of technology, the role of new technologies, the role of alternative fuels, et cetera. Uh, so this model was, was helpful in kind of putting all that together and looking at uh, essentially the economic attractiveness of different alternatives under different kinds of premises, different ranges of results. We ended up running uh, something like 3,000 cases uh, with this model just for the light duty uh, part of the analysis. and. Uh, you can imagine the amount of data that was coming out of this uh, exercise that uh, teams of people were, you know, spending uh, nights and weekends poring over together in places like Washington, uh, uh, Houston, and Los Angeles. Uh, I mentioned the different teams, but we structured these working groups to look specifically at individual options. So I was asked to form a team to look at natural gas uh, vehicles and uh, assess the possibilities out uh, into four decades out for natural gas vehicles, both light duty and heavy duty. Uh, similar teams were formed to look at biofuels, uh, which was chaired by a gentleman from uh, Archer Daniels Midland uh, here, here in Illinois, ADM. Uh, electric vehicles, chaired by Bill Reinert at to Toyota. And hydrogen fuel cell vehicles, chaired by Chevron and the University of South Carolina. So we each, you know, at the beginning, it was a bit, uh, a bit vague, you know, form a team and, and help us assess what natural gas vehicles can do. You know, okay, you can do that in, uh, in an afternoon or, in our case, in two years. Uh, you know, we took the two-year option. Don't, don't ask me why. Uh, but it, 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 it tr triggered and kicked off an extremely interesting exercise. Um, you know, we look, a, look around the room today here, here and uh, I want to echo what Doug said, by the way, which is the... Uh, just reflect on the enormous progress uh, we've made in this industry in the last 25 years, and particularly in the last 10 years, but also to, you know, provide a personal thank you to every one of you here in the room that are out there day after day after day after day trying to, trying to move this uh, technology forward. Thank you. Uh, but what I did was I gathered uh, a whole lot of people that, that I knew were leaders in the field uh, and for, formed this natural gas team. Uh, which was quite extensive. Uh, this is the natural gas team of organizations I recruited two years ago. Uh, a dozen or so of, uh, of you are sitting in the room this morning, so thank you especially. The, the team covered the entire range of, uh, you know, people that might be involved in building and expanding a, a, a natural gas vehicle industry at scale here in the United States. Uh, the one thing that was really different about this for me, you know, I've, I've spent a decade uh, 
advocating for natural gas vehicle expansion globally. But this was the first opportunity I had to sit in rooms with uh, ex senior executives from pretty much every major oil company, uh, as well as the automotive guys, and talk through these issues to get together and, and then have to stand up and kind of present uh, the case for natural gas from a reasonably objective analytical approach as compared to the other, the other alternatives, as compared to oil, gasoline, and diesel. Um, and so it, there were often uh, days when, I, when I'd be sitting in a room for uh, four to eight hours with uh, ten other people, and I was the only natural gas guy in the room, uh, only natural gas vehicle or, or produ producer guy in the room. It would be, you know, out of twelve of us, there would be uh, eight oil company reps, uh, a couple of automotive guys, and, you know, a general industrial outfit and, and, and me. Uh, that was fun. Um, it was also exceedingly interesting because, you know, you get, you get the perspective of the, the major oil companies in a way that uh, you don't just uh, reading the Wall Street Journal and the New York Times or the Oil and Gas Journal. Uh, we grew to respect each other, to learn more about our respective um, interests and fuels and technologies, and we were tasked to uh, uh, with uh, coming to consensus about all these issues that we were debating, which are exceedingly complex. So it was fascinating. But I took comfort in the fact that uh, a dozen or so of you guys here in the room today and another 50 from around uh, North America were willing to join with us and review the progress of the work as it pr uh, proceeded and offer comment on the natural gas insights we were developing as well as the, this vast uh, database we were looking at. The, uh, you, uh, Please don't try to read this one, by the way. Uh, I didn't put it up here for you to read, uh, but I put it up here to illustrate the uh, depth of detail that we went into in all these fuels. This is a, we, uh, an early part of the analysis that we were asked to do, in our case for natural gas, is to look at all, every possible barrier, every possible barrier to the uh, expansion of natural gas vehicles in the United States, technical, commercial, economic, engines, vehicles, storage, infrastructure, uh, light duty, heavy duty. Um, and so we did that, and this is just a summary uh, for heavy duty natural gas vehicles of some of the key pinch, pinch points, as we came to call them, that we were looking at around the expansion of uh, uh, trucks and buses. Uh, and we ended up, you know, we graded these things, uh, the usual uh, stoplight uh, grade, green, yellow, red. Red, red meaning if this one doesn't get solved, you don't have a business, period. You know, you, you'll have a little incremental niche business forever. But if you don't sol solve a red, a red pinch point, you're, you're, you're done in terms of being economically attractive on a sustainable business. Uh, thankfully, uh, while you can't read it very well, you don't see much red up there. I think there was one at the bottom uh, uh, around uh, ve vehicle efficiency uh, long term for light duty. Um, but you see some yellows. Yellows is, you know, this is going to slow you down. This one's going to slow you down. Uh, infrastructure is a good example of a kind of yellow pinch points that we would typically come up with. Uh, it, it can pace your expansion. Uh, you know, you can still have a business, you can still be a player, but, you know, you better get to work on this or you're not going to have the tremendous future that you think is possible. So we went through this with every alt, alt fuel, the different working groups, and kind of looked at them together. We, uh, and there was a set of findings, there was a complete chapter on infrastructure written, you know, uh, by the group. Uh, we had a big, big analysis of it within natural gas vehicles, uh, most of which wouldn't surprise uh, you folks because you're experts. Uh, but uh, it was interesting, the study at, at large, I, I would say, started with the premise that natural gas vehicle infrastructure is, is a huge problem and it will prevent the industry from really competing with uh, gasoline and diesel at scale. Uh, that was the, the bias. But by the end of the study, we'd moved that bias to saying it's an issue, it's a pinch point, it's a pacing element, but it's not going to destroy the industry and it's not going to prevent us from becoming a, a serious uh, competitor to oil. And so that was interesting. And we looked at similar infrastructure issues with the other alt fuels. Uh, now I want to get into, so I'm going to run through what we looked at for heavy duty and light duty. Um, and, so, and, and I'm going to give you the results of the integrated analysis, uh, meaning when we put all this together among the different fuel types. And, uh, you know, frank, frankly, many of the members of my natural gas team ha haven't even seen all this integrated uh, results yet, and, unless you've uh, jumped on the NPC website uh, and read the, some of the 1,300 pages that Rich was talking about. 
Uh, by the way, everything I'm telling you is public information, uh, as is this tremendous uh, tsunami of data that backs it up. It's, it's, uh, if you go onto the NPC website, look for this uh, future transportation fuel study, you'll find uh, chapter and verse uh, laid out here. Uh, it'll all be coming out in printed form uh, over the next uh, 90 days or so. But uh, on, in the case of uh, natural gas vehicles and these other alternates, you know, if you look at economic attractiveness, uh, you know, you, you got to look at costs of the systems as well as the fuel price and the fuel price advantages of natural gas. But uh, you, you, might, you may or may not be surprised to hear, but there wasn't much in the public domain on this subject. And part of the premise of our work was to find publicly available data uh, and to not be using proprietary data from companies that were involved or expert opinion, even if the experts were knowledgeable, we, we, we needed to get a publicly accessible source of information. And frankly, in the case of uh, cost of systems, uh, both for na uh, heavy duty and light duty, natural gas, we, we pretty much had to create, we had to create this publicly available information. It wasn't publicly available. There were no forecasts out to 2035 or 2050, really, on the incremental costs of uh, natural gas trucks versus diesel trucks and a range of what those costs might look, at, look like. This was the result of all the effort on the natural gas team, working with people at uh, Cummins Westport, Westport, uh, Volvo and others, PACAR, on a range of incremental costs for heavy duty starting from today and going out to 2050. And this was the kind of data that was used to run these uh, uh, ranges of cases in the model. Um, so, that, so that was the cost input. The results, uh, the results on heavy duty for natural gas, or you know, if you're an advocate of natural gas vehicles, were phenomenal. Uh, this is just the reference case, reference oil prices pulled out of the energy information uh, annual energy outlook to 2035, showing natural gas coming up from zero to 40 percent of the total uh, new uh, buys of all class seven and eight vehicles in the United States by the year 2050 with diesel coming down in uh, kind of a mirror image. And, and looking at high oil price cases, you get an even more significant penetration as you would expect with natural gas taking pretty much 50% of the total heavy duty market in, in the last uh, decade or two of this uh, uh, for, uh, forecast. Uh, the shaded areas have to do with the ranges on some of those cost curves and other premises we looked at under high oil, oil cases. Um, and I say th this wasn't shocking to me because I've been in the middle of, of this part of the business for a decade. I've seen the traction. Heavy duty is gaining. Buses, refuse trucks, starting with the big rigs now. Uh, so this made sense to me. Uh, and I would say even even the skeptics, uh, uh, you know, substitute the word oil companies if you like for skeptics. Uh, <laughs> weren't uh, too troubled by this strong showing for natural gas vehicles and heavy duty because they were beginning to see some evidence in the marketplace of movement and this kind of made sense uh, to them. Uh, although I would say the first uh, nine months or to a year of the study, I was constantly getting the question from the, the executive VPs at the oil companies as well as at the NPC is, you know, where's the evidence? I, I, just don't, see, I don't see anything happening. What's different for natural gas today than five years ago, ten years ago? No, nothing's happening. And it was only in the, the second half of the study that people started to, to recognize this new, this new price regime that we're operating under with oil prices staying high and natural gas uh, just uh, very, very low with this buck fifty to two dollar price differential. Uh, and as the study went on, that started to sink in and, and, and everyone started to say, well, yeah, this makes sense, uh, natural gas versus diesel. Uh, so we went on and just kind of plotted what this meant for natural gas use. If you look out to the right side of that chart, you'll see natural gas for heavy duty kind of in the uh, two to three TCF per year range. That's, uh, you know, that's 15 percent of total U.S. Uh, gas consumption today in the U.S. These are pretty big numbers for just the heavy duty uh, segment of the marketplace. Uh, and, and then moving, you know, so I've just summarized in about three slides, uh, you know, um, a whole bunch of analysis and a whole bunch of uh, nuance and a whole bunch of assessment of infrastructure and technology, but, but that's kind of the, the summary uh, for heavy duty. We moved on to light duty. Uh, Dick Calling from General Motors uh, was extremely helpful in our light duty work. Uh, oh, by the way, I think Dick's uh, he's, he's around, he's probably here this morning as well. But again, looking at, looking at costs of light duty vehicles for the next 40 years in the U.S., I mean, give me a break. 
uh, what do we have for information? We, we, had, we had at the start of the study one, one model, the Honda CF uh, Civic GX to work with. So on the left side, you see kind of today's kind of range of incremental cost, seven to $10,000. And we've broken this down into uh, component costs. Uh, the purple, the big purple band, which is resistant to uh, reduction there is, is onboard storage, by the way. Um, and uh, the red is the fuel systems, et cetera. But as you come out to 2050, uh, the light duty team uh, came up with these uh, estimated cost reduction uh, assessments uh, with, a, with a big reduction, as you can see, uh, and a, big, a pretty big range. So you're down to $1,500 to $4,000 by 2050. Uh, you know, if you can achieve that, and if we can sustain this price advantage that natural gas has today versus gasoline, then the economics of light duty are going to change for natural gas, and they're going to change for the better. Because what's, what's uh, challenging today is this very stiff uh, first cost uh, penalty and the extremely limited uh, availability of models uh, for people to look at. Uh, but these, this, so, so we looked at this for natural gas costs, and every other alternate did the same thing, uh, electric vehicles, hydrogen fuel cells, et cetera, uh, ran these 3,000 cases, low to high oil prices, uh, low to high uh, technology cost reduction, uh, low to high uh, speed of deployment, et cetera. And we came out with this uh, set of ranges. These are ranges across all oil prices uh, in the year 2050 of a uh, new vehicle share. Uh, liquid ICE, the second bar, uh, you can call that gasoline if you like, uh, versus close to 100% today, uh, was, was at 75% in the, in the highest penetration case for conventional liquids. And by the way, liquid ICE includes biofuels as well, so that's, that's not all gasoline. Uh, and in the low cases, uh, ran down to more like a quarter of the uh, mix. And this was the result that did surprise uh, most of the 300 people involved in this study, the very strong showing for natural gas in light duty applications. So on the left, uh, CNGVs from about 20 to 50 percent of the new, the new market share in, in the out years in 2050. And the other thing that really surprised people was a somewhat modest uh, take up of electric vehicles, certainly surprised the electric vehicle advocates. Uh, uh, and, uh, and I include, uh, uh, you know, our colleagues at the Department of Energy uh, among the electric vehicle advocates, uh, but uh, plug-in hybrids, b battery electric vehicles, etc., uh, uh, had a place, uh, took some share, but uh, everyone was pretty surprised that it took less share than natural gas vehicles. And that's the economics, you know, it all comes down to those economics we're looking at. And the fact that um, we, while we don't have a massive uh, deployment of natural gas vehicles yet, we do, we do have an industry in place that's uh, sitting here today. Uh, we have people building uh, CNG and LNG stations, uh, developing engines, uh, integrating them into vehicles. Uh, that's, that's not necessarily the case with, uh, certainly with the hydrogen industry. And uh, even the electric vehicle industry uh, has uh, more technology work to do uh, than we do in terms of the economics of their technology. Uh, fuel economy, this, this really is uh, fuel use. Uh, so you take those market share curves we just looked at, uh, we go out and look at total uh, vehicle fuel use, light and heavy duty, adding everything up. Uh, ranges again, those yellow bars are ranges. Um, and the red, the red uh, horizontal is where, where we are today. So, so you look at petroleum, about 20 quads today, and, and this, this says that in 2050, even with all the growth in uh, uh, vehicle miles traveled, um, there are very few cases that we looked at where uh, oil use is as high as it is today, just that very upper tip there, and a lot of cases where it's very much lower. Uh, biofuels and natural gas, again, were the two alternates that show tremendous potential to displace oil and uh, electricity and hydrogen less so. Um, so electric vehicles, I'm gonna, got another five or 10 minutes I think, but we'll, we'll try to wrap up. Uh, electric vehicle insights, uh, and this was perhaps uh, the most controversial uh, part of our findings, because we, we have a tremendous amount of interest in electric vehicles, as we know, uh, particularly in Washington. Um, and an awful lot, a very strong advocate base. Uh, so we, 
we, these results started to come out, and, and electric vehicle results aren't bad. Uh, they're definitely penetrating some segments of the market, but they certainly weren't dominating light duty. These are some of the insights that led to that, and the first one, perhaps the most important, just the experts feel that battery cost, energy density, uh, longevity are very high R&D investment priorities, and really a breakthrough beyond those expected for lithium ion batteries is necessary, necessary to achieve uh, economic attractiveness and the kinds of driving ranges people are looking, looking for. Uh, so that was, that was rolling its way into uh, the cost uh, premises uh, coming out of the electric vehicle working group, uh, Toyota and others, and into the models and into the uh, estimates of economic attractiveness. Natural gas, on the other hand, uh, and, and these, aren't, these aren't Mike Gallagher's insights about these fuels. Uh, the, these are the formal, official findings of the 300-person study on natural gas insights. In the prior chart, the same for electric vehicle. Uh, the economics, uh, we, we all know that the potential for long-term uh, natural gas penetration is huge, being driven by this uh, uh, economic uh, price differential. Um, Secondly, the, the, and this was, a, a, again, a little bit of a surprise to some people, that there's an opportunity for, for both light duty and heavy duty in the case of natural gas. Uh, the third one sounds pretty routine to us because we're in the business. There are few technological barriers to prevent this from happening uh, for either light duty or heavy duty. There, there are technological challenges. There are things that have to be optimized. There are new engines and vehicles that have to be developed. But there, there isn't much science that's stopping us from making really large contributions. And this was different. We were the only all fuel where this conclusion was valid. You look at electric vehicles, not the case. Uh, hydrogen fuel cell vehicles, not the case. Even biofuels, not the case if you're looking at uh, large scale expansion where you've got to get into uh, things like uh, gasification and pyrolysis, et cetera, et cetera. So natural gas stood out on this assessment of technological barriers as the one alt fuel that while it had, we have our issues, it's kind of here and now in terms of being able to put it on the road. Uh, ICEs, you know, one of the study findings uh, was that uh, ICEs will remain the dominant engine type for decades to come, but ICEs can be uh, gasoline, diesel, biofuels, natural gas, uh, so we can take advantage of that. We, we are piggybacking on all the developments in internal combustion technology that's uh, um, being uh, achieved in the uh, oil and automotive industries. And lastly, just a reminder that, okay guys, don't forget about infrastructure. You, even you natural gas guys uh, need, to, need to stay on that. Uh, we see progress, but we're talking about a massive infrastructure, both heavy duty and light duty. Uh, we, we looked at investment requirements for infrastructure, all these fields. We, we, we came up with more than $100 billion required for the natural gas expansion, just for infrastructure. Um, so not a small problem, uh, but one that uh, I felt and I feel is uh, achievable because my, I've always had the view that if there's demand for vehicles, you know, we've got people in the industry that will, will provide fuel, will provide infrastructure, and they'll find a way to make money doing it. Uh, so, I think I'll move to closure here, uh, take any questions. Uh, tremendous amount of uh, analysis of greenhouse gases. This is a pretty complicated chart. Uh, this, uh, for light, it, we were given the mission by the Secretary of Energy to see if we could develop portfolios that were economically attractive and which cut greenhouse gas emissions by 50% across the entire transportation sector relative to today not relative to uh, a, you know, a unit vehicle. So the, the first, uh, so the left uh, red uh, bar is where we are today in GHC emissions in the US. The second bar is where we would be just taking account of uh, vehicle miles traveled growing and without accounting either for uh, technology improvements and efficiencies, fuel economy, or in penetration of uh, lower carbon alt fuels. So that's the second bar. The third bar shows the tremendous improvements in fuel economy that the study team uh, believes are possible. Uh, fuel efficiency of engines, light weighting of vehicles, et cetera. So, so we can take all the uh, growth and demand and offset it with these fuel economy increases basically back to today's level. 
And then on the, on the far right is the impact of the all fuels, the natural gas vehicles with our you know, 10 to 20 percent uh, GHC improvement, uh, hydrogen vehicles, electric vehicles. Uh, and, and so we, we were able to bring down the GHC emissions quite a bit, but not quite to 50 percent. And uh, part of the reason there is that if, if you look at heavy duty, uh, really the only alternatives for heavy duty vehicles that are viable at scale are oil and natural gas. If, if we don't see we don't see hydrogen fuel cells. We don't, we don't really see electric vehicles coming into play in a big way with heavy duty. So the, so the carbon uh, options are more limited in heavy duty. So we got a, a big reduction, but not a 50% reduction. And we said on this that to get to 50%, you're going to have to do something more, like uh, uh, introduction of renewable natural gas with its very low carbon footprint in our case, like uh, greater greening of the grid uh, so that electric vehicles uh, are running on lower, lower carbon electricity than currently postulated by the EIA, et cetera. So uh, just, I mentioned fuel economy uh, already. Uh, I'm just going to close with this. And, and really, I've talked about most of this. I've talked about technology, infrastructure, greenhouse gases. Goes without saying the last one, energy security. If we can create a, a mix of alternatives for the U.S., I think it's obvious that we'll, our, our nation's energy security will be improved. You'd be surprised at how much debate we had to go through uh, to come to that conclusion. Uh, there was a view among some of the members that, uh, you know, what's the problem with imported oil? <laughs> uh, you know, I, I, uh, I had trouble sitting through some of those meetings, frankly. Uh, but, you know, there, there's, you know the, there is a story which is, look, oil is a global com commodity. Uh, you know, it's uh, infrastructure set up to move it around the world. Uh, you know, we should capitalize on that. That was a view. But most of us felt that having a mix of transportation alternatives so that we're not 99% dependent on uh, gasoline and oil was a good thing for the country and would improve energy security. The, mo uh, the most interesting one to me was that very, the end of that very first bullet uh, in the green uh, underlining. So we said, we said internal combustion engines will continue to dominate. That was a big finding, uh, particularly if you're an electric vehicle advocate or a fuel cell advocate, because you're not an ICE. Uh, but that one didn't uh, surprise me. Uh, but uh, we spent a lot of time on the next one, which is what about liquid fuels? What about oil? And this was the final conclusion, is that oil will continue to be Im important in our transportation mix, but uh, will play a, a reduced role, significant but reduced role, liquid fuels. Uh, that was a subject of enormous debate. And frankly, uh, for 90% of that debate, that finding was different. That the finding said ICEs and, and liquid fuels will dominate for the next several decades. And I, f I personally fought that tooth and nail because I said, look, you know, look at these charts we were just showing. You know, we ran 3,000 cases, and liquid fuels wasn't dominating in a whole bunch of those cases, guys. So uh, we got agreement to modify that finding to say important but reduced role. Uh, and I took, uh, took a lot of personal pride in getting that finding uh, corrected, in, in my view, to something that I think is, is accurate, reasonable, and important for all of us. So, you know, congratulations to to us as an industry, uh, you, know, you, you all set the stage for being able to uh, present natural gas in this kind of positive light uh, with uh, some of the most influential energy thinkers in the country. Uh, and these findings are now working their way across the globe. I, I'm sure you'll see people referring to them. You won't be too, see too many people uh, giving this presentation I just gave, though, because there aren't too many of us in that study who were, who were so sensitive to the natural gas implications like we are. So I'm very proud and pleased to be able to present these, uh, I think, incredibly positive uh, messages on the future of natural gas as a transportation fuel. So thank you. Thanks. Great, great job, Mike. Mike and I, actually, our offices are about 100 feet apart, but the number of days we're both in the office is zero. So I'm going to take advantage uh, of a moment to ask a question. Two questions. Uh, national Petroleum Council, is there also a National Electricity Council that advises the Energy Secretary that might have a different view of this? 
And second, I believe you had an opportunity to review the findings with the Energy Secretary. What can you tell about what the reaction was and where this work might go? Yeah, thanks, Jim. <clears throat> yeah, interestingly, there, there, don't, there don't seem to be any uh, sister organizations uh, quite like the National Petroleum Council. It was set up, uh, Rich, you may know, but I want to say uh, post-World uh, War II, almost 50 years ago, uh, to, and, and of course, uh, you know, oil, oil was the fuel at the time, so set it up to uh, analyze uh, uh, issues around petroleum and energy. There is no similar agency that the secretary, the, so, so the secretary goes to this group for anything he wants analyzed of a broad energy nature. That's this, this outfit. And while its title, uh, you know, might suggest that it's, a, you know, it's an arm of the oil industry, National Petroleum Council, um, and set up to, uh, you know, advocate solely for the oil industry. It's, it's actually, uh, it's, not a, uh, it's not a lobbying group, it's not a trade association, it's, it's a small analytical staff uh, set up to analyze, as I say, energy issues. They, they, so they don't have the capacity to do studies, they have the capacity to organize studies, and that's what they do. And uh, they get these requests about once every year or two. So these aren't frequent requests from the secretary. The one uh, just before it, um, which started in parallel with this, was, uh, was a resources study to assess uh, and update uh, North American oil and gas resources. And that was aimed at updating uh, our understanding of the shale gas revolution, really. Um, the last one they had done was two or three years earlier uh, which came out with a pretty pessimistic look at uh, future U uh, U.S. oil supply. Um, second question, uh, uh, presentation of the Secretary of Energy. Yeah, on August the 1, 1st, we launched this thing in Washington. Uh, the entire membership of the National Petroleum Council was invited to Washington. And that's some 200 of the largest uh, companies in uh, the United States and Canada. Um, so it's not just oil companies, it's uh, General Electric's and the Bechtel Group's and the CH2M Hills and, uh, and the gas companies. Uh, so they all came. Uh, we presented it to Secretary Chu uh, and uh, his uh, Deputy Secretary Dan Poneman, who had been the DOE point man, and uh, the new Undersecretary David uh, Sandalow, who was a former policy and evaluation secretary. Um, and, and there was, you know, it wasn't a uh, hugely interactive session. Uh, you know, <clears throat> the findings were presented, similar to what I've just done today, but more from the overall study. <clears throat> uh, held a press conference aft afterwards. But uh, so the secretary uh, re uh, received the report. And he, d he did uh, stand up and uh, make about a half hour's worth of remarks. He, you know, he didn't go through the study findings point by point, but he just uh, basically was very appreciative of the very uh, op, uh, the sense of optimism uh, uh, presented around the future of technology, future of alternative fuel technology, and the growing opportunities for uh, new technologies and, alter, and alternate fuels to, to rebalance the U.S. transportation system in a way that would lead to uh, growing energy security, uh, growing economic competitiveness, and lower lower carbon emissions. So, so he, he was quite excited about all the technology and technical work that had been done. We had massive amounts of work on uh, technology hurdles. We identified a dozen specific deal breaker technologies that had to be overcome in the case of batteries and uh, fuel cells and others. Um, he thought it was a tremendous amount of data that his team could use for years uh, forward, really, in assessing uh, their investment and R&D priorities. Mario? Is that Mario? No. Hey, Mike. Ron Gulmi, Emerald Alternative Energy Solutions. Um, you've identified in the gas insights and in the findings infrastructure as being critical for the development of the natural gas vehicle program. Uh, when your team and the gas team looked at infrastructure, was that solely in uh, above ground compression in terms of fueling, or did that include as well? Uh, local pipelines and gas supply and pressures and the regulatory environment that the LDCs operate in in terms of uh, getting some benefit to install pipelines. Uh, some regions of the country, there are issues with pipeline infrastructure. Did you focus on that as well? Yeah, yeah I would say less so. I mean, uh, we had an infrastructure working group uh, as part of the natural gas team. 
uh, and as part of the overall study as well. Uh, we had, uh, you know, 10 to 15 uh, experts uh, supporting the natural gas uh, analysis. Uh, with respect to, few, we primarily looked at, uh, the, you know, as you, as you put it, the, uh, the above ground stations in terms of investment requirements, so new CNG and LNG refueling stations. That was the primary focus. Uh, we, we, had, we do have some commentary in the natural gas chapter that you might want to look at about um, pipeline networks, uh, you know, leading into that. Uh, but I'd, I'd have to say that wasn't the primary emphasis. We were essentially given a, a brief as a working group to, uh, you know, assume that uh, fuel was uh, essentially available in raw, raw form, was produced and was available at least somewhere in the country. Uh, so we weren't asked uh, to go back and work all the fine detail of that kind of pipeline capillary system. But th there's some information there, but I would say not the primary focus. Yeah, I totally agree with you on that, and, and of course there's a lot of investment needed uh, above ground as well, uh, say more than $100 billion there. Um, so uh, it, wasn't, it wasn't to assume away the problem, but if we had felt it was going to be a deal breaker, uh, we would have spent more time on it, but it was a sense of the group that while it was a challenge, there were investment requirements there, the sense of the group was that if, if, uh, you know, if we could demonstrate this kind of demand, and robustness for an industry that it was possible uh, to make it all happen. Hi, uh, my name is Mark Rogers. I'm from the investment community, so I appreciate everything that you guys are uh, presenting today. But I had a question on coordinated efforts between um, the natural gas producers and the utilities, sort of piggybacking on this gentleman's question. It seems to me that over time, the price of these natural gas low-duty, uh, heavy-duty systems will come down over time just as manufacturing increases in volume. But what we don't know is the fuel differential and where that's going. It would seem to me that it would benefit both the natural gas producers and utilities to come together in a coordinated effort to m maybe not lock in, but sort of guarantee that over X period of time you can get natural gas at X dollars in MCF. And I don't see a lot of that happening, and I didn't see a lot of uh, utilities represented in your think group. So um, what's going on there, and do you think that there should be more of a coordinated effort between the natural gas producers and the utilities to guarantee X amount of supply at X price for a period amount of time? Thank you. Yeah, you get... Uh, I, didn't, I didn't show the... Uh, uh, the fuel price uh, premises of the study uh, in the interest of time, uh, other than to indicate that there were ranges uh, looked at, but, uh, you know, uh, we, we could, uh, we, used, uh, we used publicly available information coming out of the Energy Information Administration's annual energy outlook for forecasts for gasoline, diesel, and natural gas prices out, out to as far as they go, which is the year 2035, uh, extremely broad ranges in the case of oil where on the low side, uh, you know, oil drops to half its current price and stays there for 40 years, uh, you know, pretty low probability scenario, I think, to the high side where it runs up to 200 bucks or so uh, uh, in today's dollars and, you know, lesser ranges for natural gas. So, so we ran, uh, I, th I think the strength of the study is we, we ran uh, analyses of economic attractiveness across this massive range of scenarios and you know, show some findings that are robust across, across that vast range. So uh, the strength is the enormous amount of data uh, investigated and the ranges looked at and kind of the, the uh, narrowing of uh, kind of key findings that still was valid. On your point of uh, coming together and coordinating, uh, that, that's, you know, that's a bit of a slippery slope uh, for a lot of firms around uh, legal issues, uh, antitrust issues, uh, price setting. Uh, I can tell you that uh, uh, we began every, every, me every single meeting of this two-year study, and uh, that's the coordinating committee, the working groups, the subgroups, every single meeting was uh, begun with a reading of our antitrust uh, guideline, 
uh, as a group. Because, you know, you had oil companies sitting in there talking about the future of oil and gas prices, not, not really um, not suggesting what they should be, but having them uh, presented. So, it's, so it's, it's hard for me to comment on, uh, you know, any kind of coordinating approach to uh, price for, prices and price forecasts. Uh, I do know that uh, it, it's possible to get long-term contracts for natural gas set the time of purchase. There are uh, suppliers of CNG and LNG uh, prepared to do long-term contracts as a way of uh, creating that uh, price certainty that you're asking about. But uh, there's not too much I can say about the, the issue of coordinated action. All right. Thanks, Mike. Thank that, was, that was terrific.